Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Sorry, I'm at another place, uh, so I have to take my classes at another venue. So uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Is my audio OK? Everyone can hear? All right. All right, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our sessions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for yet another week, God. We thank you for your faithfulness over our lives. And Lord, thank you for yet another opportunity, Lord, to come and study your word. And even as we learn about the local church and the different facets of the local church, Lord, we pray that you will continue to speak to us, bring clarity, give us wisdom to understand your word. And Lord, we commit each one of us and this remaining the lectures into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man. All right. <clears throat> so last class, we uh, uh, we covered quite a bit of uh, content. So we uh, came up to chapter 13, right? We briefly uh, look at, so let's begin from chapter 13. The local church, which is a house of prayer and worship, right? Uh, we, I know we did a little bit of it. We looked at the local church of perpetual fire uh, and a holy incense as well, right? Uh, so uh, I think we are at the Tabernacle of David, uh, page 131 on in the books. Uh, so when you look at uh, the Old Testament in the Tabernacle of David, uh, we see that King David commanded that the Ark of God, and the first thing he did after he became uh, the king is he brought the Ark of the Covenant back and he did something so powerful. He appointed 4,000 musicians, 4,000 gatekeepers, 288 prophetic singers who ministered day and night, uh, you know, uh, in terms of praise and worship. Uh, they were making petitions 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and this went on for 33 years. That is, that is something. Right? Imagine this. Think of this. Four thousand musicians, four thousand gatekeepers, two hundred and eighty-eight prophetic singers, twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. It went on for thirty-three years. Talking about consistency, right? Look at that. Thirty-three years, uh, continuously. We're not, we're not talking about one year. Five years, 33 years. Now, David did this because he understood that the church, or we know that the church wasn't there, this is the old covenant, but David understood that the tabernacle is a place of praise and worship. It's a place of prayer, it's a place of worship, it's a holy place, it is sanctified for that. Right? And many of David's psalms, he says, uh, uh, his, he inhabits in the praises of his people, right? Uh, when we praise him, his glory descends. His power, his rule and reign, his dominion comes, right? So now we look at some of the important features of worship in David's tabernacle. And also later on, we'll, we'll, we'll just mirror that and see in the early, in the New Testament church, how is it? The same thing, right? It, it's the same because we we also, as a local church, want to be a house of prayer and worship. So there was extravagant worship and powerful in the session. Twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, thirty-three years. Just picture this, right? Uh, maybe they had a roster system uh, where the roster would say, "Okay, two hours each person leads worship." Then you have prophetic singers who sang. Just prophetic songs that just whatever that came into their hearts, uh, it it would have been so powerful. First Chronicles chapter twenty five one through eight talks about prophetic worship and uh, uh, but we'll not go through the whole thing. You know, but the tabernacle worship was not just a routine of singing hymns; they were prophetic in nature, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there were spontaneous songs, songs inspired by the Spirit, and majority of the songs, oh, uh, majority of the psalms were birthed in David's tabernacle. And look at this, prophetic songs, prophetic worship is something that 
is not is not new now right uh, if you look at what's happening now it looks like okay uh, this whole prophetic movement especially when you look at the early 1990s is when the prophetic worship movement felt like it was taking you know it was rising up from that time but if you look at it prophetic worship was way back david's time inspired by spontaneous prophetic worship by the holy spirit right and uh, yet it's very important to understand this there was orderly worship and excellence now you've got 4000 musicians 4000 gatekeepers 200 or um now, prophetic singers now in all of this right um and all of this it was not like things where people were doing whatever they felt like uh, there was order there was excellence in what was done right so there were 24 groups of teams of musicians singers had a daily schedule to follow there was rank there was leadership just like how if you look at what's happening now uh, we have rosters we have worship leaders we have uh, people in the worship team uh, and people walked under their leadership right they were highly skilled musicians and there was excellence in what was done so this is again very important highly skilled musicians it was not like they were just you know musicians no they were skilled highly skilled musicians uh, and, and and so it's very important lesson for us to learn right so the prophetic movement started way back spontaneous songs were written during these times of intimate worship with god 24 hours a day seven days a week for 33 years so if we, you know maybe if you think about it you know we are sleeping in the night and then you're feeling disturbed just have to walk to the temple and then there's worship happening there go in there you know and praise and worship is happening you it was 24 hours a day seven days a week then let's go go to the next portion here you see the prophecy of amos about 250 years after david the prophet amos prophesied and here's what he said amos chapter 9 uh 11 through 13 on that day i will raise up the tabernacle of david which has fallen down and repair its damages i will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old they may possess the remnant of edom and all of the gentiles who are called by my name says the lord who does this thing behold the days are coming says the lord when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed the mountain shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it now god is speaking prophetically through the prophet amos and he declared that he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of david restore it he will do so in such a way that the gentiles also will be included in it there will be such a harvest that many people a great harvest of people will come now think of this the prophet amos is talking about a restoration of the tabernacle a time is going to come i'm going to restore there's going to be gentiles and a great harvest coming the harvest will be so plenty the reapers will be busy gathering up the harvest for seasons and seasons and seasons to come now god very prophetically speaks through amos pointing to the early church in the early church when the gospel was spread among the gentiles the apostles were uh, you know were were gathering up the harvest think about the first uh the first sermon preached by peter right? three thousand people at one shot were added to the church 3,000 people, right? Now, what does it teach us? God has already said that it will be a house of prayer and worship. And, and here in the early church, we see it continuing. Church was being the tabernacle of David in a spiritual sense through the offering of worship and intercession. 
And here in the, in, in the early church, we're seeing that praise and worship and prayer continued on. The local churches, you and I, as part of local churches, we must have time to separate it for praise and worship and for intimate times of worship. Whether they are a small gathering, whether they are a big gathering, remember, the church, the local church, is a place of prayer and worship. So we got to develop this. As leaders, we must bring forth people. We must draw people in. We must be able to encourage people, teach people about you know, prayer, teach people about praise and worship, um, encourage them, open opportunities, give opportunities, uh, and develop this, uh, this, you know, the standard of what God has set in place. Because many times, what can happen is we can get busy doing a lot of things within the church, right? Conferences, meetings, which are all important, but we must not put this aside. Prayer and worship. Matthew twenty-one, twelve through fourteen. Jesus, again, he. Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. God intends that the church be a place of prayer and worship. Right? Uh, that, that's what he wants for us. That's what he wants the local church to be. Now, what does it mean to become or to be in a place of prayer and worship? Psalms 141 verse 2 says this. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now, one of the aspects that we see if we read in the book of Revelations is the aspect of worship. It doesn't stop. Right? All through, go all the way back to, you know, all the, towards the end, the last chapter of Revelation, with the river of life flowing, even there, there's a mention of worship. Now, have you ever thought of this? prophecies, words of knowledge, healings, miracles, all of this will see at, a, at one point of time. Preaching, teaching, counseling, all of this will see. But worship will continue until the end of time. Now, the book of Revelation takes us into the throne of God. Revelation chapter, is it, I think in chapter 5, which talks about after the rapture, where everyone are worshiping God. Yeah. Revelations, sorry, it's Revelations 4. Uh, worship is continuous in heaven. The four living creatures each have six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worship and intercession is offered continuously unto the Lord. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue will sing and praise God at one point of time. When we go in, when we pass on, when we go to heaven, we're going to be doing one thing for sure. That is worshiping and praising God. Our, the Bible says that our worship right now, even as you and I, sing and worship God and and pray. It is like incense in his presence. It is like incense. So have you ever think, thought about this? So for example, maybe we, are, we may be a small local church of maybe 50 people, but they're getting together with one heart, seeking the Lord, praying, worshiping him, really desiring more of him. That praise, that worship, that intercession is like incense in the presence of God. God is pleased in our worship. 
God is pleased. It's like a sweet smelling aroma in the presence of the Lord. So whether a local church is, you know, 10,000 people or 100 people, in God's eyes, when we as believers praise and worship Him and desire His heart, it's like sweet incense in His presence. Now, we must also understand this. Just because, you know, we praise and worship God, we are, you know, it, it's for God, doesn't mean we give a half-hearted, uh, you know, effort. God is a God of excellence also. So we see that David, he chose 4,000 skilled musicians. They were skilled. They knew what they were doing. It was not like they were practicing. And, uh, I don't know if they had auditions, but they were skilled musicians. So there's the aspect of you know whatever we're doing it we uh, our praise and our worship our intercession is for the lord but there's also the aspect of being excellent in what we do right worship covers the sevenfold realm of honor due to the king what is that seven now seven represents perfection we all know that right completion perfection perfect honor to the king is when he is honored in the seven realms that we're going to talk about. One, power. Two, riches. Three, wisdom. Four, strength. Five, honor. Six, glory. Seven is blessings. Of course, there are many other aspects of worship. Uh, these are seven important areas that when we worship God. We, we, we touch on these seven aspects. We touch on his power, his riches, his wisdom, his glory, the blessings, his strength, his honor, right? All of these aspects. Now, what is his power? Power is his influence, his authority, his dominion. So, for example, we're singing a song, right? Uh, as a church, we're just getting together, we sing blessing and honor, glory and power. Are we singing, you know, your name is power, your name is, you know, powerful, oh God. Oh, what a beautiful name, what a powerful name. What are we doing? We're touching the aspect of God's power. Oh, we're singing, who is like the Lord? He is strong and mighty. Again, touching the power, the authority, the dominion of God. Two, and riches is all the wealth and possessions. And we think, God, everything belongs to you. The wealth, the possessions, everything that we see around us here in this earthly realm belongs to you. So we're declaring it, Lord, all that we have is yours. It, it comes from you. Right? Remember that song? Um, I forget that name. Uh, uh, it says, worthy, worthy is the Lord God Almighty. Who, who gives us all that we have, who gives us all that we say, who gives us all that we do, the old chorus, right? Riches is, riches is all, all the wealth and all the possession. Wisdom is all knowledge, understanding, and skill. So I thank God, even as we are worshiping you, even as we are in making intercession, we know that wisdom and understanding comes from you. Remember what Dave, Daniel did, so powerful. Daniel chapter 2, the king has a dream. Then the king says, listen, you got to interpret the dream or I'm going to get rid of you. Daniel says, all right, master, here's what I'll do. Just give me some time. I'll go pray. I know that my God is a revealer of dreams. He goes, he prays. right? And then after that prayer, God reveals that dream to him. And he begins to praise God. He says, all glory, wisdom, praise, and honor belongs to God. Right? So, very important. As a local church, we may be in times in leadership uh, or in whatever we are doing. There will be times we may be stuck in a place. We need some guidance. Worship. Just Maybe just worship him. Worship him for who he is and say, God, this is you are the God of wisdom. Right? And when we say that, he's able to reveal and release his understanding. 
his knowledge into our lives. Strength is all his might and all his ability. I'm singing, Hallelujah, our God reigns. And, uh, oh, wait, we, we, may, we may just intercede and say, God, you are the one who is mighty. You, are, you, own, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You are able to do abundantly, Lord. You're, you're just declaring. We're just declaring his might, his ability. And, and finally, uh, honor is all his respect, his reverence and submission given to the king. I right? think, Lord, we honor you. All the angels cry holy. We we lay out we lay down our crowns. Forget that song. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus as a sign of respect, a sign of reverence, a sign of submission. Glory is all his splendor, his majesty, his greatness, his awe of because who he because of who he is. You know, when you read the book of Revelations. Uh, Ezekiel, one, Ezekiel chapter 1 is so powerful. You see, he, there's this picture of this throne of God. And then you read Genesis, sorry, uh, Revelations, and you see the picture of, of this glorified Jesus. And all you can do is fall in reverence and respect. Have you ever thought of this? John the disciple would always put his, you know, rest his head on the bosom of Jesus. Always with Jesus, always clinging on to Jesus. He knew Jesus very well. Now the same John is is seeing is gone up to heaven, and he's seeing this Jesus, a glorified Jesus, with the sun in his his face is like the sun in his radiance, hair like wool, feet like burnished grass. Out of his mouth came the sword of the spirit. When John saw this, he fell at his feet as of dead. In honor, in respect, in submission. That is the glory and splendor of Jesus, of course. You know, it's strange sometimes when we say, you know, when I go up to Jesus, I'll go shake his hands and uh, say, Hi, Jesus. I, uh, we can, but we, we must not forget the aspect of his glory. He's a glorified Jesus. He's, he's a, that his glory emanates. That even so, on the uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw him and they, they in his glory, and they said, "Let's stay here. We don't want to go down." Then, blessing is all the praise, all the worship, all the admiration, the love, the devotion offered to the King. So, so when it comes to a local church, and as believers, you and I uh, are to build or, or to touch on these seven aspects because there's many more things that we can do uh, uh, but let our worship and intercession on earth be the same as it is in heaven god is pleased with that uh, because it is like sweet smelling aroma right uh, in his presence like right? seven areas right so so then let's get into uh, movements of prayer and worship right uh, now there's I don't want to go too much into this uh, uh, 24 7 movements of prayer and worship uh, Alexander Akamai so it's got a lot of uh, a lot of history but I don't want to go too much into that so we'll come back to that if we have some time but let's just get into page 142 let's go to the day and night right you, you have that point point number 142 uh day and night right now isaiah 62 verse 6 and 7 i have set watchmen on your walls of jerusalem they shall never hold their peace day or night you who make mention of the lord do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes jerusalem a praise in the earth Right. Uh, Luke 18, 1 and 7. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought to pray and not to lose heart. Verse 7. And God shall not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. Right. Now, the point here is 
We are to become a people who will pray, who will cry out to God day and night. That's, that's what the local church is. A very important aspect. Now, we've been looking at different aspects, right? So we looked at it as a bride, the church as a bride, the local church as an army, uh, as a family of God. Uh, but remember, the house of God, the local church, is a place of prayer and worship. So how do you and I establish a house of prayer and worship? Practical ways, you know. I mean, just think about this. How did David, of course, he was a man of great power and great authority and strength and wisdom from God, where he used 4,000 odd people, musicians, 290 you know, odd you know, prophetic singers, and he got this whole thing of day and night, 24-7 worship for 33 years. How was he able to do it? Right? David was able to set it up. Uh, you know, he had things in place. Now, looking at that as our blueprint, what can you and I do in the local church? Number one is teach people the importance of prayer and worship. I always say this. As leaders, we can take a horse to the water, but we cannot make them drink the water. If you get what I'm saying. We can teach people the importance of prayer. We cannot make people pray. We can teach people the importance of worship. We cannot make or force people to worship. We can teach people the importance of reading God's word. We cannot force them to do it. So we, all we can do is teach. And I'm sure David did that. David taught from a place of experience. He didn't teach from a place of just authority. There's a difference there. David didn't say, hey, I'm the king now, so now what I want to do is have worship 24-7. No. He taught from a place of experience. He... Number one, he was looking after the sheep as a little boy. He probably, it was during this time probably he learned a lot of his musical skills. And he, he knew the importance of prayer and worship especially. When Saul was tormented by spirits, David would come and play the harp and those spirits would leave. He probably understood, wow, if I just sing a few songs with the harp, demons are leaving Evil spirits are leaving the king. So maybe, you know, he thought about this. Wow. Right. And then came a time when he was running away from King Saul. And he wrote some of the most classic hymns, classic psalms. Right. The most beautiful psalms were written from his pen at the time of grief and challenge. David understood the importance of prayer and worship. And he was able to teach his people and they capture that vision it was not like david went it was, you know he was it was not like okay now uh, who's who's rostered next day who's you not know, rostered for the next week no he he had the vision he imparted that vision to the others we are to teach people the importance of worship now in a time and age that we are living in we are sometimes not always. Now, I, I want to be very careful in what I'm saying. We need keyboard. We need good guitarists, music, you know, drummers. All of these are needed. David had them, 4,000 skilled musicians. But worship and intercession can happen even without all of that. Example. You can have a full band with three or five hours of worship. That's wonderful. And our praise is, our intercession is going to the Lord. But after that five hours of worship, we may come back empty. But you can have a one hour of worship with absolutely no instruments. But your heart is just tuned towards God. That one hour of worship is more effective than the five hours of worship. Now, is five hours of worship with the band all of that important? 
very important is it good very good is your personal time with you know of prayer and worship important very important is it is it something that is a criteria is it something that we must do as leaders yes so if i am not example i'm not praying i'm not worshiping god in my private time how my be how will i be able to impart it to others right so we must teach people develop the local church in prophetic worship and and collect you know uh strategic information on things uh, happening in the city and make prayers on that now develop your local church into prophetic worship now uh, one of the things that we did i think this was early 20 2010 2010 i remember that time we were as a worship team we were probably around 20 people 15 to 20 people in our worship team right uh, now we have a big team so i remember we we used to have uh two hours of worship in the evenings um and then that moved on to four hours of worship and we also did a full night of worship now here's what's what happened you know, during those days there were very few worship leaders so we would go and now we can't sing the same songs again and again right so what we began to do is we began to tap into especially worship leaders um because we would do one hour set so it was one hour set of worship one hour of prayer one hour worship one hour prayer that will go on for six hours right so that's three worship sets three hours of uh prayers now in those three hours of worship so we we couldn't sing the same song so what we began to do is this is 2010 early 2010 2011 we as a worship team we would get together and say okay let's just sing whatever the lord is leading us and during those days our band would be just like maybe a worship leader sometimes we would have a backing vocalist if there's no backing vocalist it's just one singer one drummer and one maybe a bass guitarist or a keyboardist one of those two would be there um, but we would i remember we would just just sing whatever came up to us because number one is we didn't have songs too many songs to play uh, and we were we would get tired trying to just figure out what song or uh you know we would get physically drained up because there were times when you know you as a worship leader you'll be leading two hours set so we began to just tap into that area. So by early 2011, 2012, we really started doing more of these things. Right? So we would purposefully, for a one hour set, we would choose three songs, three to four songs. right? And we would try to stick to those three to four songs, but we would spend most of the time in prophetic or spontaneous worship. Whatever the Lord is putting in your heart. Now, it's not something that was automatically learned. It's not something that just came in for us. Uh, you know, over time, we learned how to sing prophetically. We learned how to sing, sing spontaneously. It's a gift that we asked God for, and we asked God to release it on us as worship leaders and to help us to learn from it and to develop this gift. Right? So if you look at some of i don't know if we have any of our worship videos of 2012. um we had a good band right but a lot of it was spontaneous worship so much so that there came a time i remember very clearly 20 2012 especially 2012 2013 uh you know there were times we would just take two songs for a one set two songs the whole set would finish one hour would easily finish just with two songs now it was uh, it was something that we grew into it didn't happen over time and so we did a lot of learning a lot of praying a lot of uh you know hearing from the lord being sensitive to the leading of the spirit and um, it was really exciting time right and and we also we also have it now right we also have the spontaneous worship 
but we want to keep growing in that. Some of the things that we want to also do is have regular scheduled times of corporate worship, prayer, whether it's daily, weekly. Um, now, some of the things we have in APCs are five days of prayer and worship. Uh, then uh, in March of every year, we're doing 21 days of fasting and prayer. Uh, so again, that's something that it's a wonderful time of just coming together as a local church. Then now we have our, uh, you know, the upper room that we had, the worship night, uh, which we're going to continue on uh, next year as well, two times in a year. Um, so it's nice. It's nice. It's it's important as a local church to come together and have these times. Uh, now what's happening is we are also teaching people. Now we have young people who are coming into these worship nights. And they may be watching others. They're watching others worship. They're watching others how to, you know, and, and we, and the Holy Spirit comes, ministers to them, and their lives are changed. Sometimes there's no preaching, just the worship that touches people's lives, right? I encourage people in small groups to, with worship, prayer, and intercession as a focus, right? Uh, small groups and life groups as well. Now, one of the things I always encourage like groups is have times of you know extended worship, one hour or two hours of worship, or uh, interceding in between. Uh, you know, sometimes because it can get monotonous, right? Uh, you meet for life group, you're just doing things the same way. Uh, but some things that we encourage is as you have life group, also have times of worship intercession, right? Work towards establishing a 24-7 house of prayer and worship. Uh, this is something that maybe as a church uh, we can work into. Right? Now, uh, as, as a small church, it's easy to have these you know, times of uh, worship and prayer. But as the church grows, it's something that we must maintain. Right? Uh, but challenges to be prepared for, uh, you know, progress step by step, do not try to jump immediately into something. So for example, as a local church, we have never done praise and worship or, 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 or an intercession for maybe two, three hours. But once for all, we want to start 24 seven worship. That's going to be very difficult, right? Uh, go step by step, progress into it. Uh, so I remember we used to have two hours first, then we made it four hours, then we made it six hours and we, had our uh, you know full nights of prayer right? give time people to rest physically as well because engaging in uh, extended hours of worship and intercession can be physically tiring it is it is really physically tiring um you know, so uh, i can say this from experience as well it is really physically tiring um not just the aspect of you know uh, getting to you know you have to stand there and lead the worship but you know you're singing continually um, well you're you're using your vocal cords your body is being you know is is going through that level of you know, you're emanating you know, your energies are going out and, uh, and so it's it's really tiring at times right? so it's very important uh, I remember we used to do a two hour set, two hours straight of worship. And then there were times uh, there would be one hour of prayer after that, and then again get back to two hours of worship. And sometimes it was just two worship leaders. So one two hour set, the, the other worship leader, one two hour set. Yeah. So it would just rotate the whole time. And so it can really get draining out. So, uh, you know, we need to be able to give time rest, give time for people to rest. Um, so, with all of these limitations, now remember that God knows that we are, you know, human beings. We we cannot go past a certain limit. Uh, but the heart of the matter is, He wants the local church to be a place of worship and prayer. We can start small. We can just start with maybe half an hour and build into bigger things. Right. Uh, all right. So let's get into the next chapter. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any questions?
All right. All right. So let's get into chapter 14. The local church, the temple of God. So uh, what this is, I'm not sure which facet is this. Let's, let's just check, right? Uh, if we go to our contents page, we can see that. Okay. So we did first, the local church is the body of Christ, the family of God. It's the pillar of truth, an army, the bride, a house of prayer and worship. So now we're getting into the seventh aspect, which is the temple of God. Right. Okay. Now, this is something that we all uh, always say this, right? We always we know this as well. First Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple we are. Right now, we often quote this. Uh, it's a common passage that we quote every time these verses. Paul is writing to, a, uh, to the local believers in the church. And he's saying, listen, uh, we are the temple. In the old covenant, there was a temple. The presence of God was dwelling in that temple. In the new covenant, we don't need a physical temple. That's what Jesus was saying in John, uh, John 4 with uh, the Samaritan woman. A time is coming and has now come when those who worship the Father would worship in spirit and truth. It's no longer going to be about the mountain. It's no longer going to be about the temple in uh, Jerusalem. It's going to be about worshiping him in spirit and truth. We are the temple of God, where God dwells. We are the habitation of God, and we must be filled with his presence. The temple of God is holy, and so you and I must keep ourselves holy. Together, we have the responsibility of keeping the temple holy and free from defilement. Uh, the local church is the body, and we are part of it. So should so since we are part of the local church we are with the local church the body uh we should keep from sinning and causing others to sin as we do not want to be responsible for defiling the body now there are two aspects you want to understand here the first aspect is we are the temple of the holy spirit and so as a person as a believer we have the holy spirit residing in us we are the temple the local church is a community of believers which make up for the temple of God. Now, I am part of that. Now, the moment I sin, I'm defiling the temple of God. So, two aspects here. Right? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. Personally. But as a community, we are also a temple of the God, of, of, of God, right? We are the temple of God where the Holy Spirit dwells, where God's presence dwells. And so we must not defile ourselves, nor must, and we must be able to, you know, help others who are going through difficulties, who are living in sin, to bring them out of that, to make them understand that, hey, we are all one, we have one body and we need to keep this body clean. Look at the tabernacle of Moses. God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle. And the book of Hebrews teaches us that the tabernacle Moses was instructed to build was a copy and a shadow of the true tabernacle in heaven. And this tabernacle of Moses contained the Ark of the Covenant and it was the place where God would meet with the high priest. Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Think of this. There's a reason everything that God did had such a powerful meaning to it. It's like, it wasn't like God didn't know what to do or he didn't know where to stay. He, he tells Moses, Moses, you build a tabernacle for me. When you build a tabernacle, inside of the tabernacle, I will come and my glory will stay there. It was a picture of the local church. 
there will be a tabernacle where the glory of God will be visible in, 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 during Moses' time, because the, the glory the, the, the glory of God was visible in the tabernacle. Right? Any time you go into the tabernacle, you can see. Uh, I mean, you can't just go in every time, but during those during the times when the children of Israel uh, would you know they would sin, you had the day of atonement. The high priest would go in and make atonement for them. But they they saw, they could experience the glory of God. Right. So much so they said to Moses when he went up that mountain, he said, they said, the Israelites said, Moses, let's do one thing. You you cover your face because we can't see you. We can't see the glory upon you. It's too much for us to bear. Or you do one thing. You, you tell everything to Aaron. Let Aaron speak to us. You don't talk to us directly. Look at that. Uh, the tabernacle was a place. Where the glory of God will be visible from time to time. Several times in Israel's journey, we read instances of the glory of God filling the tabernacle. Solomon's temple. Now, Solomon has, David has passed on. He's given all the paperwork to Solomon and said, Solomon, now it's time you go build a temple. Now, Solomon, with the wisdom of God, he, he sees this visible manifestation of the temple there was this amazing picture that he had he built this temple and the moment he finished build the, building the temple it was sanctified up to god and the glory of the lord filled the temple the glory of the lord filled the temple this is what god desires the old testament is a type a shadow of the new testament Here's what Jesus said. Uh, the scriptures in the New Covenant says, The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than that of the former. The moment Solomon dedicated the temple to God, the glory of God filled that temple. Right? Look, let's look at this verse. Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14. But let's read 14. So that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Even as the, the trumpets, trumpeters were blowing their trumpets, singing and uh, praising and you know dedicating the temple to God, at a moment when the glory of the Lord came, they could not minister because the glory was so powerful that it filled the house of God. Haggai 2. Right, Haggai 2, 7 and 9, verse uh, 7 through 9, verse 9 says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than that of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. God promises his people that he will build a temple and he would fill his glory in that place. And he's saying, God himself is saying, now listen, he's saying, you think that glory which fell on the temple when, when, which Solomon built is great? No, that's nowhere compared to the glory I'm going to pour out for in the latter days. It's going to be greater, it's going to be bigger, it's going to be more revelatory, it's going to be so much more than that of the former. Right? All right, so we're... At 9.50, let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue from where we stop.